Welcome in everyone to our next installment of our Dream Job webinar series. I'm Danny Rubin, founder of our company, Rubin, and we provide resources for employability skills, writing and speaking and engaging with teachers and adults, helping students do those skills well so they can stand out for college and career opportunities. And we are delighted to have a special guest today, Michael DeMaio from Amazon, talking to us from their new headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Very lucky to have him today. And we will jump into discussion with him in just a few minutes. So thank you, Michael, for being here. We have Mac from the Rubin team here, helping out in the chat, answering questions. And Wendy Crawford here, providing sign language services to students and teachers who may need that. So thank you, Wendy. Mac, you can click off your camera and we will dive in. And to start, many of you know, who's here for the first time? Any, any Zoom hands if it's your first time here? Brand new to us, any new faces? We always have some new folks and we love that. So let me share some information with everybody before we get started. The first thing is, how many of you know that we're running a contest right now called America's Next Great Intern? Anybody seen that in your emails? I hope so. We've been talking about it for a while. We're in the middle of our voting phase right now. And we would love for you, even if you don't have a school or a student who's one of our finalists, we'd love for you to vote nonetheless. And if you go to the uh, link in the chat right now, you're welcome to scroll through our 16 terrific finalists from around the country. These students all showcase their employability skills to us and we've put them out as national finalists. Please vote. Voting runs through April 7th. We've already had almost 4,000 votes cast in our contest. So a lot of interest and we'd love for you to be part of that too. So please visit that site and, and give a vote today. It's really easy to vote, very quick. Nothing, uh, no information you have to divulge. You just click vote, that's it. So uh, that's the first thing. And the next thing is we love to give out resources. And this time we are giving out resources for job interview. Maybe you have some interviews coming up, some career fairs coming up this spring. So you, we will send you a Google Drive folder of resources for job interview. How to research companies you like, send an email to request an interview, smart questions to ask in the interview, the best way to answer any question they ask you and write a thank you note. If you would like these resources, what I'd like for you to do, again, if you're new to us, you, this is how we like to do it to keep it simple. Go to the chat right now, type the word interested and your email address. Interested and your email address. And if you are brand new to our community, what we do is tomorrow, Wednesday, we would find five minutes on your calendar to say hello by phone and direct you to these resources and help you make sense of them to then share out with your school if you'd like to. So if you're new to us, you'll, you'll see an invite on your calendar today. And if the time's not good, just suggest a new time. Okay, and I'll mention this again at the end, but we'd love to give out these job interview resources. If you'd like them, just type interested in your email address. If you're watching on a recording, you can have these same resources. Just, you'll send an email to the email in red with the subject line below, we'll get it to you that way. Also, we always have another webinar coming up. Next one is in April, and this one's a little different. Instead of talking to a person about their job, we're gonna have a discussion, a panel discussion about AI, artificial intelligence and the future of education. It's been a lot of discussion, a lot of angst, perhaps in your school system about chat GPT and these AI writing tools and what do we do with them in education? How do we wrestle with them? Do we use them? Do we push them away? What, what's the answer? We're gonna bring some experts on with us to talk about that exact topic in April. So please join us in a month. We'd love to have you part of that discussion. And also uh, everybody joining us today will receive a certificate for being here, which we'll send to you on Wednesday. So look in your email Wednesday morning for the recording from today and also for your certificate. Okay, so lots of good stuff coming up. We appreciate you uh, being interested in our resources and our webinars. So with that, I'd love to bring in our guest, Michael DeMaio, 
joining us from Arlington, Virginia, right outside of Washington, DC. So Michael, thank you for taking time out of your day. Let's start off by telling us what you're doing at Amazon, the general nature of your job in advertising. Sure, 100%. And Danny, thank you for having me here. I'm happy, looking forward to speaking to everyone today. Thank you. To address your question, my role specifically is an Amazon account executive. So to explain what that means is I have a list of clients that I am, I'm given. In this case, I have like 100 accounts that I work with. Whoa. And my, my job is, t- is tasked like making contact with the accounts and making sure I have like, the right inf- uh, contact information for them, setting up initial calls with them to understand what their goals are, seeing how they're currently leveraging our current ad products, which ones they are on, which ones they aren't on. And then under, come up with a strategy along with the client themselves about how to best leverage our tactics in order to scale their businesses on Amazon. Wow. So a couple of things that we like to do in here, we like to use our listening skills. And so you told me right up front, you have a certain number of clients that you manage. Students or teachers, can you put in the chat, how many clients does he manage? What was that number that he just said at the beginning that caught my attention? Who, can you put in the chat for me? What was that number that you heard? Let's see if you, thank you, 100. So what I'm going to do now for the students is I'm going to do what's called a follow-up question, right? Because you said 100 clients and that made me interested. That seems like a lot of clients for one person to manage. So I'm going to ask you more about that topic so I can understand it further. So 100 clients, does every team member at, in your group have 100 clients? Is it a mix of small and medium and large businesses? Like what makes up that hundred and how do you get to a hundred? Sure. So to best elaborate on that question, the 100 we have is it's it's individual to our team. So while there's while there are eight members of our team, we each have a hundred individual unique accounts. And of those 100, your assumption is correct. Several of them are bigger than others. And we actually tier them based how long we prioritize, because prioritization is very important in this role, where we understand how much of an impact we can have in terms of the revenue we drive relative to the size of the client. So I have, let's say, one client on my book where the impact of a deal that I have been able to sign might be more than what I can do with 50 accounts combined. But it's understanding where that impact can be made and making sure you're, you're uh, taking your time to capitalize on that opportunity as effectively as possible. Wow. So what I, what I was doing was I was, you know, I was curious about that 100 and wanted to ask you more about it. Let's say that I'm an intern or I'm shadowing you for the day and you say I have 100 clients. If I asked you to tell me more about that, would you be offended that I asked or would you be happy that I asked and you want to tell me more because I'm asking you that follow up? Are you open to those kinds of things? 100% because it's one thing just to understand the initial context of what someone's job is, but especially as we're trying to dive deeper into what the roles and responsibilities and the skills that are necessary to accomplish the tasks, getting a firm grasp on kind of the nuances of the role is very important. I'm absolutely happy to dive into those, given that that's an important context for how the day-to-day of the job works. I just always want to demonstrate to students how important it is to listen closely and ask follow-ups on what you've learned, because that shows maturity, and that's what employers want to see when you are going for opportunities. And as we get started, I want to encourage if everybody now could go to the Q&A along the bottom and start putting your questions for Michael in the Q&A. And I will pick through those and ask questions to him as we go. Okay, so let me share my screen. Let's just kind of get a sense of the work you're doing. So we're on the Amazon advertising page. And we're talking about helping companies to sponsor products or advertise their brand across various sort of Amazon properties. Help us understand, we talked about products and brands and display. Help us understand what you're helping those 100 clients to do. 100%. So I guess it's a little bit easier to kind of explain in terms of like a funnel, so to speak. So when you imagine how someone might be advertising, at the, very end, at the very first thing they want to do is drive sales. That's like the most important thing. But then they also want to find new customers at the same time. Because if you, there's a lot of competition on the space or a lot of competition on Amazon. So they need to make sure they're leveraging like upper funnel tactics or mid funnel tactics to feed their lower funnel like campaigns where they get most of their sales. 
So how that all works into our current ad products is we have sponsored products, which is what we use mostly to drive conversions. So most advertisers are already using those already. That's where they're seeing the fastest sales. That's where they're most, the most comfortable. It's also the easiest product to use. My job is to make sure that I'm also helping advertisers understand the impact of leveraging sponsored brands and display within their existing advertising uh, catalog. So sponsored brands finds customers in different places within the search results on Amazon. So it's a higher visibility placement and you're driving customers that may have not, that are looking for products that are similar to yours, but who haven't discovered your product yet and bringing them to your products. So that's a new way of acquiring additional customers. Additionally, on the sponsored display side, that one's a little more nuanced because it can exist in multiple places and that's both on and off of Amazon. So on the on Amazon placements, they can be appearing along with your products. It can be appearing off of Amazon on certain Amazon owned properties, but you're following customers though, maybe that have viewed your products in the past. So without getting too in the weeds, each of these products finds customers for advertisers at different stages of the shopper journey mm. from shoppers who are maybe looking for products that are in adjacent categories to yours, products that are similar to yours or your products exactly. And each of these product, each of these ad types solves each one of those one of those solutions in order to find those customers and bring them to make a purchase. So do you often have clients who you help to advertise in all three phases? And you're like really like we're going to help you to target at different stages of the funnel. Absolutely. So more often than not, I'm actually on the performance team, which means I, I tend to work with smaller advertisers who are only on sponsored products. And the reason why is because the return is is best there. And a lot of advertisers sometimes get intimidated by sponsored display or sponsored brands because they look at the ROAS, which means return on ad spend, which is how they know they're making money on an ad type. And they're not looking at the right performance indicators. So for a, for a consideration tactic for sponsored brands, maybe they're looking at impressions or clicks, but maybe the ROAS isn't good and so they'll turn it off, but that impacts their overall performance because they're not finding new customers now and their sales may suffer in the long run. So my job is really to educate on how to measure the effectiveness of certain campaigns in order to scale sales over time in order to make them feel more confident in their overall strategy and the, that they know how to leverage these tools in the future because these tools are all self, uh, self-service. So I don't personally manage them for them. I'm act as a consultant as they continue to manage them for themselves. Interesting. So how do you engage with them how would they even get to you if this is self-service? When, when do you interact? That's a great, great question. So there's two ways that this can happen. Uh, the first is kind of like me receiving my accounts. So every six months or so, my accounts will get updated. Some people I'll keep, other people I won't, and I don't really have a lot of insight into how that process works. But to give you, give you context, I had, account, I had a book of 50 accounts last year. And then going into January this year, I had 100 accounts of which <laughs> I maybe kept 15, maybe. I guess they like the work you're doing, huh? They doubled your <laughs> workload. <laughs> right. They're like, all right, let's keep, keep, keep doing what you're doing. More. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so that's one way where you just kind of receive the accounts so they give you that can you continuously update. The second way would be prospecting. And the way that prospecting works is that I will personally go onto Amazon and look at different brands. Specifically, I work in the home and kitchen categories. Okay. So I'd have the leeway to go and find home and kitchen accounts. And I'd be able to then dig into their console a little bit more on just who's selling well, who has high reviews, what's a cool product in my mind. And I can use my research tools that I have internally to see what ads they're using, if they're currently being supported by an advertising AE, if they sell in the United States or like if their business is located in the United States and all of these resources or, to, or um, data points will let me know whether or not I can reach out to the client or not based on, based on their potential, based on if they're uh, located in the U.S. And, um, and then I got to go and find the right contacts, which is not always the easiest thing to do. <clears throat> right. Then you have to go and sort of locate them and contact them and yeah, that, okay. So there's a little bit of investigation, uh, along with this uh, job uh, mm-hmm. and that was and I wanted Nick, Nick I hope I'm pronouncing it right is it Nick Strife I hope I'm pronouncing your last name thank you Nick he said how often are you contacting individual accounts so that right it, we were thinking in the same way that um, so it's a little bit of, of sort of locating who they are and this is where 
uh, we we talk want to talk about communication skills because you know at Amazon, I'd like for you to just speak to how important it is to Amazon uh, the the writing skills and the communication skills, mm -hmm. and then also how you have to use writing um, every day in, in your job with clients. But first, speak to Amazon's priority around writing well. Absolutely. So. Here at Amazon, and this is also true in the way that we uh, we speak internally as well. Trying to, the goal here is always make is always putting the customer first. So when it comes to like, writing a uh, a document, what we call we call like internally, we call like like uh, memos or docs. We always make sure we we outline what the problem is, what steps uh, we're what steps we could take to like, we've already taken to reach towards a resolution, as well as what we anticipate like either needing help with or. Um, we, we, I, I'm trying to think of the best way to summarize it for you guys, but essentially it's setting up a problem, like what the situation is, what actions are we taking, and then what's like the desired outcome. So that's a, we try to format it as best we can within those parameters. But to frame that in terms of how we approach clients, it's incredibly important to make sure we're being empathetic towards a client's business. So understanding what their business problems are, we, we usually set up like an initial call with them to understand what their business issues are so we can address any concerns they have, leveraging our resources and make sure they understand them all. So it really, the biggest thing that I would say is coming from from coming to a client from a place of empathy, understanding that they're unique like points. And then like, I can give, can give you an example of a client right now who's having yeah, problem, problems with their products right now. They they found out that their, uh, their products are being sold by someone who isn't authorized to sell them. And the client's very upset and actually reach out to me, but even though it's not my department in terms of this problem, I still have, still have time to talk to the client and see what resources can we leverage internally in order to get them back in a place of like being uh, being happy with the service that, that we're receiving. So it's it's definitely a, a nuanced case from client to client because some clients don't want to meet in person. So you get comfortable just emailing them because that's how they're comfortable communicating. Or you have other, you have other clients who want to meet more regularly because they need more help and you can kind of make adjustments to your schedule to meet with them more frequently if you think it's a kind of a benefit to you in the business overall. But it's understanding each client's unique communication style. If you can, like maybe like be like more like uh, more formal with them if they prefer, if you can kind of tell mm. the way you interact with them or if they prefer more like a laid back conversation and you can pick up on all those little nuances from your initial calls with them and then just make sure you're delivering the appropriate, uh, the appropriate level of satisfaction for the client in terms of like what you're delivering them in terms of the value you're, you're providing the data you're providing, et cetera, but approaching it from a, a lens that they're the most comfortable with. So if it is more formal, if it is more casual, uh, et cetera. <laughs> so you're saying, you know, really understanding who you're talking to, communicating in a way that, that they would want to be communicated to. So it's mm -hmm. using people skills to get a sense of the person and then adjusting how you're approaching them based on how you know uh, you know, what they prefer. Absolutely. Which, which takes some practice, right? I mean, it's, you have to kind of be at work a little bit and engage with customers to get a feel for that, right? You have to kind of use your instincts a little bit, but also just the, the you would you say like the repetition of just doing this over and over makes you better? 100%. I mean, I'll, I can give you, give you an example. In, as far as Amazon is concerned, there actually is a program we have internally called the uh, AAE program or uh, account executive or uh, sorry, assistant account executive program. And this is a program that Amazon conducts internally when for, with new hires in the AE that are going to be account executives, where we train in terms of a lot of these soft skills in order to become more confident in how we work with, with clients. And then after a few weeks of getting those, getting the practice in, then you got to essentially do your reps, so to speak, where you, you, you're then given your book of business. They say, go on, like start making some calls. And <laughs> it really forces you to kind of just get your get your feet wet and like just kind of jump in head first because at the end of the day, while you have, you're given this account list, it's up to you to kind of make the business, business happen and continue to scale it. You have a lot of like teammates you can lean on in terms of like what works best with them and how you can maybe apply it to how you approach your business. But at the end of the day, to deliver results, it all comes down to, to you and yourself. And we call it internally uh, being scrappy. So scrappy to find the right points of contact, being scrappy to pull the correct data to tell a story. It all kind of feeds back into being to the role and being successful. I love that. I love that idea of, of being scrappy. Um, and and do you also have to use the phone? Do you have to call people sometimes and speak on the phone? We have to call 
we, 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 we have a goal of, get, of calling, uh, having 84 conversations a month. So you're calling all the time. Wow. And that's another number for the students to remember 84 conversations a month. And in his case, across a hundred different clients. So a lot of big numbers here that he's having to manage month over month. I want to, um, well, let me get to these questions and I want to share um, a, a Nick, another question from, from Nick. How do you ever travel to clients or is it all done uh, like over the phone or through email or virtually? This is this is the same Nick that asked the uh, how often we contact the yes. clients, right? So let me I'll answer his first question and his second question and one. So how often we speak to accounts, Nick, depends on like where you see the potential for the account. So for like my largest accounts who are, I see a lot of growth potential, I might meet with them weekly because one, they're really leaned into advertising. They take my recommendations seriously. And I see opportunities to scale the business for smaller accounts. Either they're like hesitant to work with me or they don't really want my help. They don't want recommendations. I'll maybe check in once a quarter, which is like every three months or once a month to try to get back in contact with them. And I'll still try to like make opportunities to build trust with them through the data sources that we have and trying to hold regular conversations to build trust. But it will depend if you want to do it like weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or quarterly. And like that's kind of how we space these out. The second question regarding if we travel to see advertisers, that used to be the case before the pandemic, where there used to be a certain number of people who would travel to uh, see their clients, specifically their higher value clients, the ones that are like their big ones on their books of business. And that was all to continue to facilitate and grow the uh, the relationship because relationships are so important in this business where we're like the face person for this, like this, for this client on Amazon more often than not, because there are not really a lot of opportunities for people to connect with people actually working at Amazon. And as far as in-person visits, they are starting to resume again now. I'm actually going to be taking my first in-person visit ever oh. in, in May. So where are you, you going to go? I'm going to Austin, Texas to meet with my, uh, one of my biggest clients. Wow. That's very cool. So there, there you go, Nick, that he, sometimes he does get out of the office and <laughs> uh, go to a human, uh, human to human connection. Uh, a question from Joanna Unity Reed High School in Manassas, which is not far from you, Michael, in Northern Virginia. Do you have to travel to different Amazon campuses for your job? That one is less frequent. Um, at least in my particular capacity. I know that, for example, managers and senior leadership will often travel from campus to campus. And internally, like I'm what's called like an L4, which is a, it's almost like a positional rank. But I know the L5s and L6s, they often will travel in between campuses for different leadership events. But in my capacity as an AE, which is very client focused, I probably, I won't be traveling to as many campuses unless I had like other internal responsibilities. But in my capacity right now, being a client facing role, I can do everything that I need to do from, from here. Great, thank you for answering that. I wanna bring up, cause you mentioned that your focus is um, home and kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to bring up, um, actually I think it was a different, hold on, I had a different screen cause I had a different one going. Here it is. And you can see my cart on the side with mm -hmm. random things I need to buy. <laughs> um, but let's just talk about what, what we're looking at here, where the advertising comes into play. Like I see this is sponsored. So like, tell me what, what we're looking at and where like your job comes into play on this screen. For sure. Actually, I'd actually be happy to kind of use my, one of my own clients if you'd like. So if yeah. you want to scroll to the top, to the top and look up Uni, O-O-N-I. They're a pizza oven brand. Okay. So as we can see here, Uni Pizza Ovens, they are like, they're kind of one of the predominant pizza oven makers on Amazon. And as the very first thing we see right here on the top of the screen is what's called a sponsored brands ad. So this is, this is the big banner at the very top. And the reason why this is unique, you can compare it now to what's where on the results section, this Amazon choice product. This one is just a sponsored product ad because it's just the product image as well as the description. And as, you, as uh, Danny's pointing out, it's sponsored. But when you compare it to the sponsored brands advertisement, you have the brand logo, you have a custom headline, Cooking with Fire, Uni Pizza Oven Bundles, as well as a giant lifestyle image of, of the product as well. So these pizza ovens are, are designed to be used outdoors, on patios, uh, for like, uh, in this case, they're at a beach. These are all examples of when you use this product. And so we use a lifestyle image in order to demonstrate how you use the product in real life. So these sponsored brand placements are highly visible 
and really give like a lot of brand personality the way that a sponsored product ad may not. So that's why these are two very different um, approaches to advertising. See. But then, but then secondly, I like to show you. If you click on the Amazon choice down there, the, the Uni Karu 12, this one. And if you scroll down a little bit, keep scrolling, keep going. Up, oh, is it going to show up? Let me see if it'll show up or not. Ah, uh, doesn't look like it, like it doesn't look like it's showing up. So, but it's okay. But the the point is that now for sponsor display, there are usually placements where you can set right there that that Poco Barrow Italian. Uh, as far as that wood is concerned, that's what's called a sponsored display ad. Okay. So normally what we do, and I'll have to talk to Uni about this when I see them next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what can happen is that when a customer visits detail page, competitors can actually bid to appear on your detail page in order to pull mm. your customers away to buy their products. Wow. And so what, I, and so what, I've, what I've done with Uni here which, which should be popping up, which is not, is they'd have other Uni products appearing within these display placements. There's also would be one right around where your cursor is right now, Danny, like right about there. Yeah. Um, so there's like, there's like two or three different placements and that's one of them. And so the goal there is to make sure that the customers do click away, they click away to another Uni product as opposed to clicking away to a competitor product. Right, because like if I'm Uni and I'm advertising, I don't want another company advertising on my own product page so right. how do you how do you uh, rectify that with Uni and say, look, by the way, either you spend the money for this space or we're putting a competitor on your own page? What do they say to that? Well, they, I mean, it, once again, that depends on if the advertiser is more leading to advertising or not, because more often than not, um, for like for Uni, they're like, we got to get these guys off. We know how important like our yeah. how valuable our brand is because they are they're the predominant player in the pizza oven space. So their placements are highly valuable and highly, highly coveted. They want to protect their spaces, but for a for a smaller advertiser, it might be more difficult to make that argument, just because they don't they don't just don't understand like the benefits of maintaining customer view build, like viewership on your pages. So it takes a lot of time to kind of build up that trust about why that's important. But what's actually very interesting now, I just realized that person that was advertising on this page, they're actually a wood brand. So what this client's what this person's going for is this oven is a wood fire and gas right. powered oven. So they're trying to cross sell their product here. So they're saying right. anyone that's looking at a pizza oven will want to buy wood to right. power their pizza oven. So very interesting uh, efforts on that advertiser's It's part. like, you know, customers who bought this also bought this because you're right. going to use them together. So it's not another pizza oven. It's a complimentary product. So perhaps Uni isn't as afraid of that because it's not like an exact a competitor for what they're trying to sell. But uh, this is great. Is there anything else worth sharing while we're here uh, looking at your, um, you know, looking at various products and sponsors? I'm trying to think if there's maybe one more example I can give you guys. Um, let's try. Hmm. If not, that's okay. It, this, it, this was, I, 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 that's, that's, my, that's my best example. Like, that's perfect. great. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's that's very helpful. I think for for the students to see exactly where your work is showing up. And, and how much of a conversation it is with these clients, right? To make them feel comfortable, educated on what they're spending money on. Because it seems to me that if you wanna work in advertising, you have to be really a really good people person to be very clear in what you're talking about so that they understand where their money's going. So it's almost like uh, you have to have excellent customer service to work in advertising, would you say that's the case? I would absolutely say that's the case. So whether it's an account executive that works at an agency or in my case, working for Amazon directly, at the end of the day, like I guess, like I said earlier, you are the point of contact for a client, often for all their goals for the business. So making sure that like you feel like the, they feel like they're being heard in addition to uh, being empathetic towards their problems and trying to find solutions for them in the best way that you possibly can is all critical to maintaining those client relationships, which end up driving your business as well. Yeah, and I, I, I you, you made the point earlier that, you know, for most of us, Amazon is this gigantic company. But in, like, if someone like Uni, basically, you to them, you are Amazon, right? Like, you're the one they talk to, right? And you're the one they associate with the company. So, you, you know, Amazon has many, many thousands of employees, but in to Uni. You are Amazon. And so how you act, how you behave makes them think about Amazon. 
So not to put too much pressure on you that, you know, <laughs> you're the face of this uh, international corporation, but I want to stress to students that when you work for somebody, how you behave makes the person think about the entire company that way, positively or negatively. Do you ever think ab about, do you feel like that responsibility in your job? 100%, like, with, without a doubt. Like we're, we are always told that in whatever capacity you're, uh, you're presenting yourself in, you're, you're representing like the company that you're working yeah. for. So making sure that you're always being respectful, presentable, um, very taking, like not, not like pushing off advertising concerns, making sure that you're actually like being as present as possible with them is all like mission critical. I love that. Uh, we had a question from Joe Crispin and it's a good question just about education. So I know your background, you were working in nonprofits before you came to Amazon. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your educational background and do you need to have gone to school for advertising to work in advertising? Sure. So to give you first my background, I received um, my bachelor's in communication studies and political science. So I was a double major at the University of San Diego. And then I took some time off to prepare for graduate school. And I actually ended up uh, getting my master's in integrated marketing from Northwestern University. Wow. To answer your question though, as far as the need for a degree to get in advertising, um, for our AAE program, like to get like to get, kind of get your foot in the door, you do need a bachelor's degree. I'm sure being involved in just advertising in general like would help, but I do know we have people in, in the program that did not study advertising who just are very competent in their writing skills and being able to speak to an audience. And that's all also taught as well. But when you go through our interview process, there are several sections where you need to be able to present to uh, the people that are interviewing you, as well as answering questions in a specific way. So there are skills that are going to be taught to you in the program, but collectively, you need to already be like comfortable speaking, making yourself understood, um, being able to articulate well, and feeling like feeling confident in being able to let's say tell a story mm. and sell something. We talk a lot about storytelling in our resources to our, to prove a point, you know, put it in the form of a story. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another follow up question, if you can remember. Do you remember any of the questions that you were asked during your interview to work at Amazon? Sure. I'm not sure if I can actually answer that. Oh, I'm okay. pretty, sure, pretty, pretty sure we signed an agreement that we wouldn't. Got but, it. Um, but what I, I can tell you is that Amazon has a specific way of facilitating interview questions and how we, or how we were uh, asked to answer them. Sure. It's called the star formats. And that's something that would be very uh, easily Googleable, but it essentially asks you to be able to tell a story in a specific format based on a question that a uh, that an interviewer would ask you. So if you're asked, tell me about a time when you did this, make sure that you have a collection of stories of which one you could pull out as an example to present in that given format. That's amazing because in our curriculum, we, we have a lesson around a uh, job interview. We tell students walk in the room with three stories that you've made notes about that you can refer to and as an example of a time you've overcome a challenge. So in the moment when you're nervous, you look at your notes and say, oh yes, I wanna tell that one specific story as a representation of how I act. So I love that Amazon is doing that already because that's what we're instructing students to learn um, in the classroom is to lead through a storytelling approach. So that's great to know. And that gives some insight into Amazon are there any students here and teachers, you can raise your hand through the student that would like to work for Amazon one day? Anybody who would like to work for this company? And there's so many different jobs. This is just one of them. Mm -hmm. I think Michael's giving us a fantastic look into the world of working in advertising at Amazon, which is so fast paced and growing every day. Um, I want to just take a pause and I'm going to reiterate the, the resources that I mentioned at the beginning. And then we'll wrap up with our special guest. So let me go back to the top. And just again, a reminder, if you came in a little late, we'd love for you to be part of our national contest running right now. Um, we, I'll put the link back in the chat to, uh, to go and vote for one of our terrific student finalists in our America's Next Great Intern Contest. Please uh, go grab a quick vote before you're done with us today. All 16 finalists are there. I also mentioned that we have a free 
Google Drive of resources for a job interview. And um, just a little insight here, we were just discussing it. It says the best way to answer any question, and that is to tell a story, which I know Michael would appreciate. And we already have it in some resources you can take with you from the session today. So we're totally on topic with what, everything we're talking about. So if you'd like those resources and you missed this offer at the beginning, go to the chat right now, type the word interested and your email address. And if you are new to the Ruben community, we will reach out for a five minute phone call on Wednesday with, a, with an invite on your calendar and the time you could change the time and suggest a new one, but we'd love to talk to you for a minute to really drive this re these resources home. If you're watching this on a recording, many teachers do because of uh, the time situation or many people could be spring break right now. Um, you uh, can send us an email to the email on the screen. Also in uh, a month, we'll have another great session. We're talking about the future of education and AI writing tools. So a really good conversation to think, where are we going with chat GPT and so many other tools hitting the market and how does that work in the classroom? How can we make these tools help us, not hurt us? And finally, everybody today is going to get a certificate for being with us. And you can put that in your portfolio for, uh, for the long term to share off with employers and whomever else. So um, uh, again, just to, to bring it back around to our guests one more time, and we'll wrap up in just a couple of minutes. There was a question from Heather about how long have you worked for Amazon? Maybe you said it to me before we started. Tell the group how long you've been at the company. I just passed my one-year anniversary about a month ago. One year. So, and he's already at the six-month mark. They've jumped him from 50 to 100. Uh-oh, maybe I'm a little nervous for you at the one-year mark. They're going to give you 200 clients, Michael. So you might, might <laughs> want to look out for that. <laughs> They're just going to drop it on your desk and say, go. So, right, so get scrappy. So we're over here is crossing our yeah, fingers. Yeah, like, you have to get <laughs> real scrappy with uh, 150 or 200 uh, customers. Um, any last thoughts for students who uh, maybe didn't even consider advertising as a career path, but make your best pitch why this is a great career field and something that students should explore? 100%. At the, at the end of the day, team, the way that business works in general is even if you're not selling a product, you're selling yourself. So being comfortable and being able to publicly speak in order to like address an audience and make yourself understood, tell a story in order to make like a, a critical argument, those are all going to be really important skills for you. And no matter what industry you end up in, especially as you're looking to progress, because the more you can stand out from the crowd in terms of your ability to articulate your feelings and um, sell a product, that's only going to continue to project you going into the future. So the couple of things that I would leave with you are like, if, if you're interested in a role in advertising would be these, first of all, you, being able to use data to tell a story. I'm not sure like, the exact curriculum that your teachers are teaching, but that will be one element that, that's, that's very critical in terms of being able to take elements of data and tell, use, tell a story to, in order to sell something to a client. Secondly, being able to present in front of an audience, like I've been being home right now, uh, whether it's in front of like one person on a, like in, a, in this case right here where I'm speaking to all of you, but it seems like maybe I'm just talking to Danny and to Wendy, but being able to be comfortable and make yourself understood and speak uh, clearly is all, are all very important skills to be, to be had, especially when, like, let's say, an advertiser is a novice. Two problem-solving skills are getting scrappy, being like an entrepreneur in and in of a sense, where you're given the resources to do something, but feeling like feeling the initiative and like the go-getter mentality in order to continue to drive that home. And that's true with any business as well. If you want to start your own, if you're working in a large company like this, how can you best manage all the resources you have access to in order to continue to grow your business forward? And then finally, it would be objection handling. So what we call objection handling is you present to a client, you have the data, and you're trying to make them buy into something. They might say, well, what about this? Or, well, I don't think that's true. And being comfortable with the fact that not everyone's going to agree with you, even when you have all the data to back it up. So have backups to what to understand how could they try to rebuttal you? And that's also very common in public speaking. Understand the arguments that can be made against what you're trying to say in order to better position yourself to be, to like win the argument, so to speak, in the future. So being very comfortable in, the, in objections is also very key for a role like this, as well as any kind of entrepreneurial role in the future as well. Yeah, having to really think on your feet, 
react to what they say, have a plan for what they say. Mm -hmm. Those are excellent skills that would work across a lot of jobs, but especially in advertising or, or in sales, for sure. Excellent advice. Michael, we want to thank you for being with us today. Really, really cool to hear from you from Amazon's new headquarters, which was much talked about you know, in the news the last few years. So we wish you all the best in your new career. Hope you continue to move up to be an L5, L6, and whatever's after that. We hope the best for you. Uh, thank you to Wendy for your help. Thank you to the teachers and students for all of your questions and your engagement. We hope we see you in a month for our discussion on AI. And again, please vote for our finalist students, be part of our first ever contest. And we will be speaking to you soon and emailing all this out on Wednesday. Thank you again so much, everybody.